This video is on the basics of how to interpret your scripture, to figure out what does the scripture mean. So we'll look at the very basics of what you're doing when you're going through the interpretation phase. Interpretation is the fourth out of the five steps in studying the Bible, where you have prayer that starts you off and it continues throughout the rest of the four steps. Then you go into observation, correlation, and then interpretation, what we'll be talking about now, and then the final step being application. Let's look at the passage in Ezekiel 16 verses 1 through 4 to kind of get an idea of what we would do in the interpretation phase. So say we're still kind of in observation, and we read the text. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite, and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. So in your observation phase, as you read through that, Remember, one of the aspects that you're doing is picking out things that you need to study more or know a little bit further. So let's say in that phase we looked at the Amorite part. We want to know, okay, why is it saying that their father was an Amorite? So that's one of the observations that you made. Well, now that you're in the interpretation phase, you're going to take that a step further. And you are going to choose to look up the word Amorite. So what you do is you get out a Bible dictionary and you would look up the word Amorite. And once you find that, you're going to read the context of what it's speaking about Amorite and see if there's any hint in that Bible dictionary that tells you why Ezekiel would be talking about the Amorites being their father. So in looking up Amorite in a Bible dictionary, we'd see if we use Wood Marshall's new Bible dictionary that we have the information given to us, the name was also used as a general term for the inhabitants of Canaan. And he also goes on to talk about how Ezekiel well intended the mixed population of Palestine being a lot of Amorites into there. And as you can see in there, he not only gives us that information, but he gives us background information of where he's getting that knowledge from. He quotes different passages uh, in Genesis and Joshua to show why he's saying that the inhabitants of Canaan um, had the general term as Amorite being applied to them and then he gives a little bit more detail and actually specifically mentions the passage that we're looking at about Ezekiel and saying it's because so many Amorites made up the people of Palestine that that's why they're become, being called at their father. Now this wouldn't be the only stop that you would make, you'd use maybe more Bible dictionaries if you have them and there might be more information that's pertinent to what you're looking at within the text where it's talking about Amorites, but this is just one example. So what we did with Amorite, we could also do with Hittite, and looking up in a Bible dictionary and some other words that are in here. But instead of, keep, instead of doing the same thing, uh, let's look at how we would use a different kind of resource than just a Bible dictionary. At the end of this verse, it says, You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. So let's say we want to look up the concept of salt. One could use a Bible dictionary to look up salt or an encyclopedia, but another type of resource that you can use is one that gets into the customs and the culture of the people at that time. So in this case, I'm using the book of Nelson's Illustrated Manners and Customs of the Bible. So one of the things you could do there is get into the context page, and because we're trying to find uh, information about salt, we would see in the content page that there's a chapter on the minerals and gems of Palestine in chapter 13. So we'd want to turn to that to see if we could find an entry on the idea of salt. Upon opening the resource, we'd see the fourth mineral mentioned is the idea of salt. So we can read that entry, and one of the things that's of interest that comes up with the idea of salt is it says, by biblical times, salt had become linked with health hospitality, purity, and durability. And again, Ezekiel actually happens to be mentioned about speaking about newborn babies being rubbed with that salt. So there it kind of gives us a little bit more information on how salt was used for health back in those days. Well, let's look at another type of uh, resource that we can use when we're interpreting the scripture. If we're looking at Ezekiel 16, we can see after he speaks about the Amorites and the Hittites, it says, As for your nativity on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut. 
So we could say, okay, we want to look more into the idea of nativity. And again, we can use a multiple amount of resources in looking at that. But let's say we want to get at uh, the original language. Say, okay, this is the Old Testament, so Hebrew. I wonder what the Hebrew word is behind nativity because I want to know what that Hebrew word actually means. I know what nativity means in English, but is the Hebrew word the same there as what our English is getting at? There are many ways to get to the original language behind our English text, but we'll look at just a couple of those. The first one is going to be the most common way. If you have some kind of resource that will allow you to know the Strong's number according to the word that you're looking up, uh, or if it's kind of like on the slide where the Strong number is either above or below your word, uh, on the left-hand column at the very bottom is our word nativity, and I have a red arrow pointing to the Strong's number that's a 4138 and what we would do then was we'd use a Strong's dictionary and you would just look up that number the number would be in numerical order though it would skip some numbers because they correspond to proper name um, but otherwise you're going to be looking at 4138 and once you found that you're going to see the uh, where it talks about what that Hebrew word is and what that means Another way you can do that, which we won't get into today, is you could have an interlinear. And they have that tan arrow that kind of points to the Hebrew word down below nativity that's being translated that way. And then what you can do is you can look up that word in a Hebrew lexicon. That's a little bit more difficult and takes a little bit more work because you need to know the order of the Hebrew alphabet to be able to find your entry a little bit easier. Um, you're going to have to know um, the dictionary form of words. You're not going to be able to look up that exact word because it has suffixes and prefixes added to it. Uh, so it take a little bit of work to try to figure it out. So it's doable if it's the only resources you have, but it'll take a little more grunt work or a little bit more uh, time just because of not knowing the flow of the Hebrew. So the best bet is if you don't know Hebrew or from the New Testament, you don't know Greek, is to use those strong numbers. So let's just take that example and say, okay, we know now the number is 4138, now let's look that up. So what you would do then is you'd flip to the page so you found 4138, and I just put the entry after that just to show that they're in numerical order. Now just to give a word of advice, if you're looking up this resource that I've cited, the Theological Workbook of the Old Testament, it doesn't go by these numerical values. I changed them for the ease of what we're doing here. Um, it actually uses a different number scheme than what Strong's is. So modal F would really not be 4138. Uh, so I changed it because I don't technically usually use strong numbers. Uh, I use another form of numbers, but uh, the average person is going to be more looking at the Strong's numbers. It's uh, a little bit easier to get a hold of with those kind of resources. They're a little bit more affordable. So we're going to use that example, but I just want to warn you, if you go out and buy the theological workbook of the Old Testament, it's not going to be geared towards the strong numbers, is it what it lo looks like here on the slide. But otherwise, if it was, if you're using a Strong's Dictionary, which I don't happen to have, or have on electronic form, so I had to use one of the dictionaries that I do have, you find 30, or 4138, and you see modal F is the Hebrew word that's being translated there, and then it gives us a definition or um, some renderings of what that word can mean, kindred, relatives, and they give the example that sometimes it can be wrongly translated as nativity or birth, and then it goes on to give more information, but again I cut that out just to show the linear motion so I could put 4139 in there, but let's look a little bit more at what some of the dictionaries could say about this word. So in your definition in the dictionary, it can give you those different nuances of meaning. So we have here, one of them is family and relatives, another one is children, and the third one there that I uh, emphasize with the bold is birth, and it says the natural act of birth and coming to life, but focus on identification of that birth with a clan or people. So that's what this word that's being translated as nativity means. So really we see that it's exactly what our English says, but there's some cases that there's going to be a, a better definition coming out of the original language than what is actually in our English language. Now I didn't happen to choose an example like that because I just wanted to stay in that Ezekiel 16 passage, but this hopefully shows you the basics of if you have these resources with strong numbers 
and you have a strong dictionary then, the process of how you can utilize those to look up to see what that original language is behind that word. You don't have to be able to read it um, because it's going to give you the English definition of that and sometimes it'll pull out a deeper meaning. Because we're into dictionaries again, I just want to give the warning again because it's a common thing that we do wrong when we're doing original language studies or even using dictionaries to define our words is to remember that there's more than one definition to the word. Words have plurality of meaning. They have different nuances of meaning. And here I'm giving an example of the Hebrew word hasav and how it's usually translated mercy but it has the aspect or the nuance to it of loyal love, of loveliness, of favor and of kindness. And there's different ways that that Hebrew word hased is used in scripture in a little bit different way. So we don't want to just take one definition and think it applies every time that word is used. And again, we don't take a definition or look at a dictionary and find the definition that we feel would be the coolest to be in that application. We're using context to help us determine which definition is the one that is right for that passage. So let's look at some examples with mercy, but let's go to the New Testament now and be looking at what would actually be Greek words, though we're not going to get into the Greek. But if we read Hebrews 2.17, it says, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for sins of the people. Now here, merciful, we can see in reading the context, has an idea of atonement attached to it, or the idea of what Jesus Christ is doing for the people and being merciful. Whereas mercy, when used in Matthew 9.13, is going to have a different sense of meaning to it. It says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And this is a quotation of Micah, or sorry, Hosea 6.6. 6. And Hosea there uses this passage. And when we look it up there and we use our Bible dictionaries or our lexicons, we find that mercy there means unfailing loyalty. But the way Jesus uses this passage when speaking to the Pharisees and them and their disregard for what Jesus is doing for the poor and the hurting in these texts. And he says it, I think, three times in the book of Matthew, where he makes a statement to them that they don't understand what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. With the context Jesus adds, he adds a little bit more to it than just that Hebrew meaning of unfailing loyalty. When we add this idea of loving our neighbors as ourselves, then we get this idea of unfailing compassion. And that's what we see in this mercy, is that God desires unfailing compassion more than he does for sacrifice. So it's a little bit different meaning than what we've seen in Hebrews, where there's an atonement aspect attached to mercy. So how does this all come into play? Well, let's take Luke 18, 13 through 14, and think of the passage that talks about, actually it's a parable that Jesus gives about the Pharisee and the tax collector, uh, praying next to each other in the temple. And it says, But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the question to the person studying the Bible then is, what does merciful mean here? Does it mean to be kind to those in misery? Of God, please be kind to me because I am a wretch? Or is he talking in an atonement sense of God, be merciful for, to me, a sinner? Meaning, make atonement for me? That I realize that there's no temple sacrifice that I can do for the mistakes that I've made, so I need you to do some atonement for me? Or is there some other nuance to the word merciful that is being shown here? 
to the language that applies to this verse, and that's the job of the Bible student and the, uh, studying God's Word is to figure those things out. And I'm not going to give you the answer to that. And if it's something that you're curious of and want to know, that's a great one to dig into. See, what does merciful mean there? What, what is he getting at by asking God to be merciful to him? So as an overview, some of the resources that we use in interpretation, again, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just hitting the very basics of what we're doing in interpretation and some of the first steps you can get the hang of before you go on to more of the advanced stuff. But one of them is the dictionary. Looking up key concepts that are spoken of in your passage and learning what do those mean, like when we looked up the word Amorite. The other phase was using a lexicon. And I'm using this in the aspect of getting to the original language and saying, okay, I found this English word in my Bible, but I want to know what the, if it's in the Old Testament, the Hebrew definition to this word is, or if it's in the New Testament, the Greek definition of this word is, <clears throat> to get a better understanding of, of what God is saying through his word. Now, this is a good point to bring up a precaution. We don't look up our words in the English dictionary. All that's going to let you know is maybe more of what the translator was trying to get across, but it's not going to really let you know what God is trying to speak to you more in depthly. If you come across the word anger in the Old Testament, you could break out a Webster's Dictionary or an Oxford Dictionary, and you could read up anger and find out what it means in America, but you're not going to find out what it meant in the Hebrew culture of what anger meant. You look up the word anger and uh, uh, lexicon and depending on which Hebrew word is being translated as anger which multiple Hebrew words are translated as that it could mean a flaring of the nostrils which is going to give you a lot better of a visual image of what the Hebrew people were thinking of when they said anger or another version of the word anger can mean the face turning red uh, and a third one can be a shaking of a person when they're angry the Hebrew people didn't talk in abstract language like what we do of just concepts of anger, but they had visual imagery that went along with it. So when they said anger, they didn't just speak of some weird concept known as anger, but there is something associated with that like that. If you were angry, you were basically saying your nostrils were flared or your face is turning red. So when we get into the original languages like that, it can really help us visualize what's going on in the Bible and get a better sense of what's going on. So never use an English dictionary in order to better understand what God's saying through his word because all that's doing is letting you know what the translators maybe was trying to say more. And God wasn't speaking to the English language, so you can get yourself thrown off by understanding maybe what our English word is when that's not really the word that God used. It's okay to use if you're just trying to get an idea of what the Bible's saying and it's an English word you don't understand. The thing that I'm talking about is if you're using it to interpret scripture, don't use an English Bible. If you don't understand a passage and you don't understand the English language that's being used, it's okay to use an English dictionary to try to figure out what are they saying here. But we're getting at trying to interpret what the scripture's saying don't use an English dictionary and be very leery if you ever hear a pastor say and if you I looked up this word in the Webster dictionary because that's a bad way of studying scripture and then the last thing we looked at was culture picking out resources that'll help us understand the culture a little bit better and again dictionaries can do that as well but there's some good books out there on the Jewish society um, or culture as a whole